trying to uh, re-engage with these ideas to do with uh, taboo words for certain parts of the body. And I will be using the C word again in this video, so if that's a problem, you know, you might not want to watch it. Um, yeah, I think one of the interesting things I found about uh, the C word, uh, uh, cunt, and also words like prick and fuck, is that they're used very consistently in a particular um, lexicon. They're used together. They're part of a pattern of language, um, which is quite different from other patterns of language for the same activities, the same bodily organs. This is something C.S. Lewis talks about. I'm not a great admirer of C.S. Lewis, but he cites in the Stephen Pinker book. And he says something like um, that when you want to talk explicitly about sex, we're forced to use the language of either the nursery, the gutter, or the anatomy class, he says. So when we talk about uh, sex and sex organs in a, in a nursery, we would use words like you know, winkle or willy or uh, front bottom or something like that. If we're talking about it in a, uh, well, what, what C.S. Lewis calls the gutter, if we're using it in a vernacular, um, in a vernacular like a locker room sense or, in, or between consenting adults, we would use like words like prick and cunt and fuck. And if we're using it in the medical or an anat anatomical sense, we'd use words you know like penis and vagina and sexual intercourse. So there's different lexicons in these different areas. And there's two things come out of that. I don't know if I get to them both in this in this video. One is to do with um, you know why we separate those things out and what what the implications are. What because we tend not to mix them. You, you, would, you would very rarely mix words from the different lexicons in the same sentence or in the same context. It would feel weird, you know, if you were in a highly charged sexual relationship with someone, you know, in the heat of passion, to start using words like willy or vagina, it would, it would sound weird. Um, similarly, you know, if you're in a, a, a doctor's surgery and, and the doctor asks you to get your prick out, it would be weird, you know, it would just be odd. Um, and you certainly wouldn't use either of those languages in in around children. So, um, they are quite specific. And, and also, as I say, you wouldn't mix them, you wouldn't mix them in the same sentence. You would, you'd keep them to context and you'd keep them consistent. And I think what's going on there is that different aspects of those uh, activities, those bodily organs, are being drawn out in those different contexts. You know, there's, there's, there's a, there's a, I think there's a whole set of associations, different associations, in each of those contexts that's being referred to. So even though the activity, you know, the core activity, the core um, part of the body is being referred to in each case, all of the associations that are possible for that are being kind of um, pruned and, and, and steered and focused upon in, in, in different ways. So when, those, when words like vagina and penis and sexual intercourse are being used, the, the association we're supposed to get from those are to do with um, uh, perhaps med the kind of medical aspects of that, perhaps the, um, um, the purely reproductive aspects of it, um, you know, all that kind of formal stuff which would belong in, in Dr. Surgery or the anatomy class. If we're using words like fuck or prick or cunt, then I think we're being much more steered, well, we're steered away from those things, you know, we're steered away from concerns to do with those formal properties, to do with much more emotionally laden qualities, to do with, you know, people with um, complex emotional identities engaged in complex relationships. Um, with, with complex parts of the body that have all kinds of other functions and, and difficulties and pleasures around them. So I think we're being, we're being steered towards that. And in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of nursery context, if we're using the, the language, the lexicon appropriate to the nursery, we're kind of deliberately steering away from you know, the kind of difficulties of adult sexuality and also the, um, the complexities and the specificities of, of of anatomy and, and medicine, and we're, um, and we're kind of invoking a set of associations much more to do with, you know, those appropriate to a child, really, I suppose. So, the, so lexicons belong in locations, I think, in, ter in terms of that. Um, yeah, I was really surprised to hear that, uh, that C.S. Lewis had said that, actually. I was 
you know, I hadn't really um, figured him as, the, as a person who would say something like that, but he is cited in Stephen Pinker's book, so I assume it's correct. Um, what that makes me think of, I haven't got time to go on to the second point, what it makes me think of, just to stay within that, is the is the, the, the way that language does function, perhaps in a more general sense, very specifically to the context in which it arises and is used. You know what I mean? Because in, in, certainly in terms of those, those, uh, those three versions of the same words I've just used there, um, you know, prick, cunt and fuck, uh, and the other two, uh, two sets, you know, they are, as I say, they're, they're words for exactly the same activity. You know, exactly the same activity and exactly the same objects. It could be even the objects that belong to the same people, if you like. But the, but the invocation is completely different. And it's just in the word. You know what I mean? The, the, all, the, the entire invocation is different according to which lexicon you're drawing upon. Uh, and there's no neutral one. There are no neutral terms you can use. You know, there isn't, there isn't a, a, a set of words which doesn't invoke some kind of a context. There isn't a word for the penis or the vagina, which just strips it in any of those contexts. They all feel like they belong in these situations, you know, the nursery, the gutter, or the, or the anatomy class, as Lewis says. And I'm sure that they must be true of other, of other words, probably of all words and, and all concepts. You know, it may well be that all the language that we're using is, you know, arising from contexts. I'm sure it is, actually. I guess I'm just rehearsing it for myself, um, it is arising from particular contexts and evoking particular contexts, but also potentially um, uh, erasing potential uh, meanings and potential contexts. Um, you know, even the ones that sound neutral, you know, all the words that sound neutral, I think a lot of the case, in, in a lot of cases, what's actually happening there is there's just a kind of er, an erasure going on there of the context, or, the con or we just assume that the context is neutral because the language, because of the way the language is operating. I think that's a debate that's, uh, that's been popular within uh, certain branches of feminism to talk about uh, male-gendered language. It just sound, quite often words like mankind sound like sound like neutral terms. But of course they're not, it's, 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 uh, it just appears neutral because the context is so uh, hegemonic. Yeah, that'll do, I think. <laughs>